Hi everyone, nice to, to see you. This is the Mega Mix main stage. Welcome, welcome to everyone. And uh, first of all, before we start, uh, I just wanted to thank our partners, uh, Red Barrel, uh, Stadia, Square Enix, Ubisoft, and the City of Montreal. Uh, my name is Carl Edwin Michel. I am the founder and the CEO of Northern Arena. Uh, we do everything esports. We do tournaments. Uh, we do also events. Um, we have a, a really good content team for creating TV shows. And I'm also the creator and the executive producer of the Canadian Game Awards. Uh, if you didn't have the, the, the chance to see the Game Awards, uh, please go in our virtual booth. You'll be able to see uh, the 2020 uh, Canadian Game Awards and see a little bit more about what we do as a company. Speaking of uh, tournament, uh, we, are, we are organizing a tournament for Mega Mix. So it's the combat of the cousins. So it's Quebec versus France. Um, and we're going to play Trackmania, Clash Royale, and uh, a speed run of Donkey Kong Country 2. It's going to be a lot of fun. That's going to be on Saturday. So don't miss it. Uh, it's going to be on the Twitch channel of Mega Mix. But we are here to talk about leadership. And uh, we're going to have a great afternoon all together. Um, I just wanted to give you a little bit of the schedule on the main stage. So right now, 2.30, obviously, we're going to start with a keynote, Building Team Performance with Trust, and that's going to be with Emily Geer, uh, Greer sorry, from Double uh, Loop Game. So it's going to be a lot of fun there. Uh, we'll have a five-minute break, and then we'll go to the leadership panel, uh, Building and uh, managing teams in 2020. So we'll have a, a great group of panelists there. We'll go after that to another five minute breaks. And then you guys will have to go, we'll, we'll be able to go to your breakout uh, discussion session, talk to uh, you know your, your folks and have fun there. And then come back at 445 for a fireside chat with Aaron Offman from Sense of Wonder. Now, I just want to remind you that obviously we have a Q&A section and you'll be able to ask all your questions there. <clears throat> so. Uh, during during the presentation, during the keynote uh, of Emily Greer, uh, please ask all your questions. I'll get uh, you know uh, as much question as possible when we'll get back uh, with her and chat and ask and be able to ask her a bunch of questions. Now, research has shown the most important factor in high performing team is psychological safety. What is psychological safety? Why does it matter? And what can leaders do to develop it? At a in, in a team. So uh, Emily Greer is the perfect person to talk to us about this. Why? Well, Emily is the co-founder and CEO of Double Loop Games, a, a new mobile game studio. Previously, she was the co-founder and CEO of Congregate. Uh, her company launched hits such as Adventure Capitalist and uh, Animation Throwdown. Emily is well known in the game industry for her presentations on the economics and the psychology of free-to-play games. We're going to have a great presentation from Emily, and then we'll, go, we'll come back and chat with her. Please welcome Emily Greer to the stage. Thank you uh, for that nice introduction, Carl, and I'm happy to be here. So. Good, good. Oh. So you'll... You'll be so able I to just, go with your presentation. Okay. Yeah. I just keep going. <laughs> Sorry, this is a little bit uh, uh, kind of a new, 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 new format. Um, hopefully, everybody can see my presentation. I'm just seeing myself on the screen. Okay, great, cool. Uh, yeah. So today, I'm talking about building team performance through trust. There's no games is one of the most interconnected and team-based uh industries that exists and we're all trying to make better games we're all trying to make uh better performing teams and i think that um trust and psychological safety are underrated elements in what makes a game a success so uh carl gave me uh, uh some introduction um but uh here's a little bit more um so who am i so i I've been in the games for almost 15 years now. Uh, my I entered into games in an interesting way in that I came in as a founder. I co-founded Congregate uh, with my brother, Jim. Um, if you're not familiar with Congregate, it we built a browser gaming platform that was sort of like YouTube for games uh, that became very successful through the late uh, two 
2007-2010 period. We got bought by GameStop. We went from just me and my brother up to 30, 40 employees. And then we built a mobile publishing arm uh, that pu published more than 50 games over the next three years. And it ended up growing all the way to 120 employees with uh, four offices, buying other studios, lots of remote employees. So I've really gone through uh, a pretty big journey uh, and taking a com company from as small as that can be to uh, significantly large and had to deal with a lot of uh, team performance in issues and how does a team scale. Last year, I left Congregate uh, wanting to start uh, a new thing, which is um, to finally make games after having been a platform and a publisher. So now uh, I'm uh, running a mobile studio called Double Loop Games with a title coming out hopefully next year. So most, if you have been on the internet much at all uh, in the last few days, uh, you've probably seen a lot of jokes about uh, the four seasons total landscaping. So the, if, you're, if you haven't been on the internet, uh, the background of the story is this. Um, on last Saturday, uh, when the election in the United States was still uh, um, in dispute, um, the Trump campaign organized a press conference in the outskirts of Philadelphia, uh, and President Trump tweeted out that it was going to be at the Four Seasons. The hotel, the Four Seasons Hotel, quickly sent out a tweet clarifying that it wasn't at the hotel, uh, and, they, and it turns out it was at Four Seasons Total Landscaping, which was a uh, business out in the outskirts of Philadelphia in between a crematorium and uh, a sex toy shop. Uh, so not a terribly presidential or official looking uh, uh, location. And while they were giving this press conference, uh, conference, all of the networks called the election for Joe Biden. And there were just tons and tons and tons of jokes flying through um, all parts of the internet about how about this gaffe and the appearance. And I don't know what happened. I don't think anybody really knows what happened. Um, but I think it's an interesting thing to look at. Whatever they wanted to achieve, it wasn't to have uh, with this press conference and having it at this location, it wasn't to set up a lot of internet jokes. And it's not hard to see that it would trigger a lot of jokes. So how did a group of people, not just one people, but a group of people decide this was a good idea? And how did it get so far without somebody saying, wait, I think some people are going to be confused and I think some people are going to make fun of us for having a press event at Four Seasons Total Landscaping. And this, I think, is actually a good framework for thinking about what happens when you don't have psychological safety. Now, what exactly is psychological safety? So sort of the official definition is that it's a shared belief held by members of a team that the team is safe for interpersonal risk taking. Now that's a little kind of psychologist psychologist speak. I don't really know what that means. It doesn't have a visceral sense. So here are some more plain language definitions. Uh, a psychologically safe team is where one where no one on the team will embarrass or punish anyone else for admitting a mistake, asking a question, or offering a new idea. It has a climate characterized by interpersonal trust and mutual respect in which people are comfortable being themselves. That's a psychologically safe environment. And Google has done extensive research on teams um, and found psychological safety to be far and away the most important factor in team effectiveness. Now, obviously, there's other things that matter as well, dependability, structure and clarity and meaning, but nothing was as powerful as psychological safety and the willingness for a team to take risks and be vulnerable. So why is that? It comes down to the fact that it leads to stronger group thinking. There's more learn from mistakes. You identify significant risk a lot earlier if people are willing to speak, to speak up. Um, you get more innovation and more successful execution of innovation when everybody's contributing and everybody's seeing and saying what might go wrong. 
you also get more employee engagement because when people feel like they can, they matter and they feel like they can contribute, they're more likely to contribute. So there's a sort of positive cycle that happens. And just in general, what, what's happening is that you're taking a collection of brains and multiplying them as opposed to just finding the parts that overlap. So psychological safety has the most benefit in environments where there is high interdependence and high uncertainty. Hmm. What industry does that describe really well? It describes game development. And Google's not the only one who's done research on this. Uh, the Games Outcomes Project is a really interesting project that, that uh, came out, I believe in 2014 or 2015, that took a a lot of data from a lot of different projects and studios and companies of all different sizes and did a deep dive on how they they organize themselves what they were like and how the games did on a financial in financial perspective critical perspective all of that and they found a lot of things that had no correlation with success they found a few things that did have strong uh, correlation with success, one of which was clarity of vision for the game, which is sort of a no-brainer. But the other one was, again, psychological safety, team trust, all of those types of things. Um, so yes, this is really important in games, and we're seeing it through a lot of different research. How do you measure psychological safety? Google uh, asked team members to rate whether they agree or disagree with these statements. If you make a mistake on this team, it is often held against you. Members of this team are able to bring up problems and tough issues. People on this team sometimes reject others for being different. It is safe to take a risk on this team. It is difficult to ask other members of this team for help. No one on this team would deliberately act in a way that undermines my efforts. And working with members of this team, my unique skills and talents are valued and utilized. So these are all questions that uh, you know, really sort of show how the team is interacting and what is going on. And there's a lot, of, quite a few different nuances there. If you break it down, it you can sort of organize the different elements into um, these four buckets. One is, and this is the bedrock one, is inclusion. We all have a basic human need to connect and belong, to feel accepted and valued. And if that's not happening, it's never going to be sort of a safe environment for you. Then on top of that, you start building up these stair steps. First of all, is it safe to learn? Do team members feel like they can ask questions? Can they admit mistakes? Um, how does that work? Can they, does it feel safe to contribute? Do team members feel like they have the information and autonomy to contribute without micromanagement? Do they feel like they might be undermined? Do Can they do that? And finally, and this is, I think, the toughest one for a lot of organizations, is it safe to challenge? Do team, team members feel comfortable dissenting in discussions, challenging the way things are done, pointing out risk when the manager uh, is you know, focused on one particular thing? Can you do that? And that's you know, the culture of a studio, but it's also the culture of an environment. And there's a lot of, you know, countries, areas, you know, families where uh, conflict is really uncomfortable. Now, there's places like, you know, New York City is famous for being sort of a brash and aggressive place with a lot of conflict. But um, a lot of other places really value um, uh, uh, sort of everybody working together and everybody agreeing, and that can make it hard hard to challenge. So how do you break through this? Well, first of all, I think you need to start with inclusion. Uh, and the way I like to think about it is that a team should be a balanced party and it's not a leaderboard. It's very easy, easy as humans to fall into the trap of status seeking, of feeling like I need to be a little bit more important. I want to be sort of the main person. I want to, to get ahead. And when you get into that mindset, it's pretty easy to be measuring yourself against others and pushing people down. Um, if you're doing that, um, if everybody's doing that, then it's a very um, kind of... Uh, 
knife in the back type of em, uh, of environment where you're kind of pushing each other around and down. What you need to get to is the feeling that everybody's working together and bringing their different skills and uh, creating something that's broader than the whole. And that's a mindset both for the leader, but also for the individual team members that you need to model and you need um, and and you need to enforce um, any kind of kind of uh, uh, backbiting, ne really negative talk about other people, any kind of status seeking really needs to be nipped in the bud. The other thing is kind of so simple, it's a little dumb, but it's also um, still something almost everybody needs to work on, which is to ask questions. The best way to get people to share what they're thinking about on anything is to ask them what they think. And you need to do that on a lot of different ways. You need to you know, solicit input and opinions on decisions to be made. You need to ask for feedback upwards. Um, Feedback going down is relatively natural. Feedback going up is a lot harder. And so you need to work at um, um, making that happen. You need to go out of your way to hear from the quiet people, the people who are more reticent or more conservative. Um, and that's to do that, it's important to ask things in a lot of different ways so that uh, people can feel comfortable in one environment or another. So group meetings, sure, but also one-on-ones and surveys, either named or anonymous. The other thing is it's really important to open that up. Um, and so I think leaders should do regular uh, AMA sessions, so Ask Me Anything sessions, where the team gets in the habit of asking leadership questions, and that helps train the muscles on that, uh, on that environment. But it's not enough to ask unless you listen. And in, in, in fact, it's almost counterproductive if you ask and then blow all the feedback off and if you don't show that you are listening. So below is listed is a lot of different techniques that are classic, you know, um, deep listening, engaged listening techniques. First of all, you need to focus on what people are saying, not your response. It's very easy to start thinking of your response in your head while you're listening and that's bad. And I fall into that trap. That's something that I'm constantly fighting myself. You need to show curiosity. Um, if they say something, keep digging in, keep finding out more. That shows that you're really listening. And you need to pay attention to body language. Um, obviously theirs, what are they uncomfortable about talking about? What are they not? But also yours, you're having a conversation with them with your body, even if you're not saying anything. Uh, don't interrupt, allow interruptions. That can be very disrespectful um, and validate what they say and show your your understanding you know you can repeat back a little bit of what they've said you can agree with statements different things that show that you that you really heard and then this is the important on it part of it act on it when you can uh, not everything is actionable not everything is possible um, and when you can't Explain why, explain your decision-making, bring them into the process. People can take all sorts of no's or all sorts of, um, of, of you know, we can't do that if they understand why. Pull, bring them in and they'll really appreciate it, even if what they want is um, impossible or unrealistic. And this is really important. Um, you wanna focus on solutions and avoid placing blame or shaming people, either directly or indirectly. And often it's that indirect blame or indirect shame that is um, the most insidious. Um, you need to get away from why did you do that to instead having a conversation about how something happened and always with a mindset of how can we make it go better next time. One thing that I think makes uh, difficult conversations much easier and builds that sort of muscle memory into teams is to create structure around feedback. So uh, I think retrospectives are really helpful. There's something that we did uh, um, you know, once a month at Congregate, we're doing with uh, quarterly and with every major milestone at Double Loop. And I like the star Starfish model where we talk about um, you know, kind of what happened and then what do we want to do more of? What do we want to do less of? What do we want to keep doing, start doing, stop doing? That kind of structured environment 
really pulls things out of people and makes it easier to talk about things that otherwise would be hard. Similarly, um, uh, for bugs, for other types of problems, it's really good to do different kinds of root cause analysis. One kind that I've used is called five whys, where you look at what you're doing and kind of work through five levels of why did that happen. Um, and that helps you understand what was systemic and get away from any kind of individual blame or individual failure. You're looking at the broader perspective. And again, it makes it easier to have that hard conversation. It's also really important to set the tone early on a team. Um, new hires feel insecure. That's when you're most vulnerable coming into a new environment is when you're the stranger and everybody uh, else knows each other really well and knows the environment. That's when you can really break through and make them feel um, included and respected right at the start, especially because they've often had bad experiences at previous workplaces. They're bringing in scar tissue. So you want to make them feel safe and respected just as quickly as you can. Some things that we did at Congregate. So um, I got, especially as we got larger, larger um, I wanted people to know that me, the CEO, the founder, knew who they were and knew that they were important. And just a really easy way for me to do that was on their first day, I went out of my way to find them in the first you know, half hour that they were there and welcome them, show that I knew who they were, chat a little about what they were doing, their background, and just generally welcome them. It felt like a small thing to me. Um, but interestingly, when I left last year, the team put together all sorts of like, you know, testimonials and roasts and other, other things. And one thing that came up a lot from a lot of people was how meaningful it was on their first day to get that greeting and how them it made them understand that Congregate was a different place and a different environment than one that they had had before. We had also did, uh, um, quarterly new hire orientations where we take people um, through kind of the company history and how we got to different places and implicitly teaching them values. And I put in a slide in there, um, both because it was important history and because it was funny, but also because um, it set the tone on making mistakes, which is um, I shared my biggest one, which is that I said no to Minecraft in I think, you know, 2008 or so, 2009. And, uh, you know, I would post the kind of email between me and my brother and not so they could really see that it happened and, 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 and how it happened. And then I would say, you know, don't worry about making mistakes. Everybody makes them. You can't make one that was worse than the, what I did. And we still had a successful company. And again, that really set the tone on, you know, this is a place that's safe. This is a small one that I personally like, so I keep pushing it. I think it's really great when you can share communal responsibilities, take something that's necessary and unpleasant and benefits everybody and share it out um, and share out that load with everybody, no exceptions, whoever they are. Um, one example, at Congregate that we did is we had a weekly kitchen rotation of somebody was in charge of starting and unloading the dishwasher. Um, I was on that rotation, my brother, all the VPs, there's 50 employees at that office, you know, um, that's once a week. And I think it really set the tone of, you know, everybody's importance is the same, um, that the hierarchy doesn't matter and that we're all in this together and all taking care of each other. And I really, really like that. But the most important thing is you need to lead by example. Leadership will always set the tone for the for a team, and they're going to behave the way that you behave. Um, first of all, be approachable and open. Um, acknowledge your own mistakes, and especially in a larger company, express gratitude and share credit, and particularly share credit upwards so that they know that you're taking care of them. Treat everybody equally, show that they matter. If you do all of these things, um, your team will feel safe, your team will feel your trust, uh, and your team has a higher, much higher chance of trusting each other and excelling over the long term. Almost all of this 
in the end is about communication. So the more time that you spend working on your communication, the better. Here are two books that have been helpful to me and to other people I know that I recommend. One is Nonviolent Communication and the other is Difficult Conversations. Uh, and some other research resources. I've got links here um, to some of the stuff that I've seen, Google's research, the Games Outcomes Project, a long New York Times write up on Google's research. Um, the, another thing that's a useful resource is the talk that I did earlier this year at GDC, um, GDC about how to prevent harassment. Um, that has a little bit about psychological safety. It has a lot to do, um, about other dynamics of teams and environments, um, and it's something that I recommend um, um, for you to watch for more on this and other uh, team talk topics. That's on my link to on my Twitter, and I'll also uh, post this, these slides on my Twitter as well. I'm at Emily G. Thank you. All right. Well, hey, I'm back. Thank you. Thank you, Emily. <laughs> thanks. Uh, thanks for this great presentation. Uh, I'm sure people learned a lot. Uh, just uh, before I, I start with some questions, I just want to make sure that the, uh, if people want to, if you want to ask questions, please uh, use the Q&A uh, section and we'll be able to uh, ask your questions to uh, Emily. Um, I, I have one question uh, mm -hmm. to start. Uh, mm -hmm. That question comes from Jason De La Roca. It mm -hmm. says, how do you align pay, pay incentives versus no leaderboards thinking? Mm -hmm. um, so one thing is to be as transparent as possible about, um, um, uh, about pay and be really fair about it. Um, so as you get to a larger company and the earlier you can do it, the better, have um, think through what the pay level is at, di at different um, at different levels of responsibility and expertise. Align that with a market and know exactly what you're going to do. Um, everything doesn't need to be equal as long as it feels fair, right? Um, and fairness is as important as equality. Um, I think we all understand a world where not everybody and not everything makes uh, the same amount. And especially when you're in a, an environment where different companies pay people for different things, if you paid everybody exactly the same, that's going to be really distortive too. So you, you kind of need to work with the world that you're in. Um, I do have, um, you know, I do have sort of strong feelings about the minimum that you pay people, um, and especially for jobs that are often disrespected or less respected than they deserve. I think uh, community management, customer service, QA are three categories where um, I feel very strongly that you should be paying them above whatever the market is because those are um, hard jobs and uh, uh, deserve more respect than they're getting in the broader environment. Now, um, engineers, on the other hand, get all the respect <laughs> And and, and uh, um, sort of financial credit in the world, and so there we're you know paying, we t I, you know tend to be paying more around you know whatever the market is, and then um, having a plan. Uh, but in general, it's about um, um, being careful and thoughtful about it, and being fair and as transparent as makes sense. There's companies out there um, that are fully transparent in terms of um, salaries, like uh, uh, GitLab has a calculator where you can go and see what the pay range is for everybody in any location by job title, which is amazing and a really interesting resource. So I, you know, Part of me aspires to do that, uh, but uh, I, I'm not quite sure we're there. But in general, like, if your pay leaked to everybody tomorrow, could you defend it? If you can't, then you need you have work you need to do. Yeah, is there other things than pay, like other incentive that you could uh, utilize? Uh, let's see. Um, I mean, there's um, you know stock and bonuses and 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 other things like that. Um, that can be distortive in different environments. Um, uh, I you know um, 
you know, we had uh, uh, gave everybody stock options at Congregate, and all of our early employees um, um, were able to buy houses in the Bay Area, San Francisco Bay Area, um, which is actually, um, you know, <laughs> it, it, it was that, that's a, that's a, that's a pretty big deal. Um, and so things like that are are can be really great, but it is also important to make sure that whatever those are is that they are aligned with incentives. For example, um, you know, I've seen things go really wrong in, you know, free to play companies with quarterly, you know, bonuses and targets where everybody is so incentivized to hit short term numbers that they gradually destroy, destroy the economy of the game and keep making short term um, decisions sort of again and again. Um, compensation and pay is a really uh, tricky thing, uh, and and it's something that nobody can act, should ever claim to be an expert on. Like it's just something that you need to keep working on and keep working on the feeling um, that it's giving people, um, and keep that in mind. That's great. That's a great question because uh, I mean, obviously, mm -hmm. not all companies. You know, uh, mm -hmm. when you're a smaller company, you don't necessarily yeah. have the means to yeah. uh, to pay your people uh, a, a, yes. you know, astronomic uh, salary. Okay. So. I like the options of, of uh, stock options. That's a, that's a great one. Yeah, or and you know, like the quarterly bonus um, would being destructive. That happened in a particular environment. Um, but if you you know a indie team with a premium title, you know you don't you know giving out bonuses after you've had a big success makes perfect sense. And it, there's nothing distortive about that. Like that's a great thing to do and a great thing to to share with the team. Perfect. I want to go to another question. Uh, mm -hmm. Any tips, experience on how to become better at doing less micromanagement and therefore make uh, your team feels uh, more trusted? That's a question mm -hmm. from uh, Maxime Lee. That's that's a great question. Um, I think experience. I absolutely micromanaged my first employee so badly, and we could never we could never get back from that. Um, and so my second one, I was like, I, I very deliberately kind of stepped back and, and, and it, and it worked better. Um, you know, this is a funny one, but, uh, get really busy or go on vacation is actually an excellent one. There's all sorts of things that I was involved with as, uh, congregate with scaling that I, 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 sh I needed to let go of and just, totally leave to the team. And we would discover that when, you know, we were in acquisition talks and I was too busy to be involved or I went on a three week vacation and everything was handled fine. And that, that helps build, build trust. Um, you know, that, that worked for me, but, you know, uh, internal, um, uh, internal introspection of, do I really need to be doing this, um, uh, is really helpful. And um, the, you know, uh, asking, you know, asking your team um, what they think you could be less involved with. Now, that's something you could do, actually, in one of those, like, retrospectives, right, that I was talking about is, you know, what should we do more of? What should we do, do, do less of? Um, I think, you know, if there's anything that you're involved with that you think might be borderline, just try not being involved for a week, just saying, I'm gonna like mute this email or mute this thread, or just set a task for myself. Don't respond, don't get involved for a week and just see what happens um, and see if that, if that can help you break through. That's amazing. Uh, I have a, maybe a last one for you. Um, mm -hmm. You were talking earlier about the, you know, you were talking to people like the person or people that are starting in a business for like 30 mm -hmm. minutes, just to give them like a, a welcome. Is there mm -hmm. other tips like that that you, you use um, prior that uh, help them feel welcome? Yeah. Um, so one in an environment where you have multiple offices is that I would go to the other offices and just, you know, show up and be there for a few days and have a few meetings, but also just be physically present in that office. There's just a level of, you know, um, intimidation that you have when nobody sees you. Um, and if you just show up and go to lunch and show yourself as a regular person, um, 
that that helps. Um, showing your quirks, showing the things that you're sharing, the things that you're passionate about, showing sh showing your weirdness um, is really is really good. Um, I'm a um, competitive adult figure skater, which is a weird world. And um, like I would do, we would do uh, Christmas outings um, to the ice rink, and I would give people lessons or other things where just you just show you show your weirdness, um, and that's really helpful to people. That's good. That's good. I have actually another one. Uh, okay. any, any tips on how to deal with uh, micromanaging managers? Uh, <laughs> that's, yeah, I, um, I, I that that totally uh, that totally drives me crazy. I think you know, trying to have a conversation about them, a conversation with them, and say. And have a conversation about what you need um, and what they need, and ask ask them, okay, what do you need to like leave me to this? Like, I think this is this interaction is is like a little frustrating to me. It's not a great use of your time. What do I need to show you up front, or what do I, how do I need? How can we structure the process to make you feel comfortable with what I'm doing? Um, so you know, there if maybe it's you send an update um end of every day that shows you know the art that you've been working on or the project and just send a five minute email so they know what's going on and don't feel like they need to get involved like that might be sort of an in between that sort of gives you the space um because there's you know in every interaction there's a you know two people have needs and you have a need for autonomy they have the need to feel like everything is going to work out okay. How can you both meet those needs? And having, working to have that conversation um, and and also working to find, figure out, okay, when's a good time and what's a good method for this? Like I had a boss where we had really frustrating interactions whenever we had an argument in person, but my mom, because um, I felt like she was just blowing me off. And my mom suggested that I was overwhelming her and that I should put the same stuff into email. And I found that when I put the same things into email, then she could like take it at her own pace, not be overwhelmed by my enthusiasm and come to her own sort of conclusions. And then we had much better interactions. Um, it might be the reverse. It could be all sorts of things, but figuring out what works for that sort of unique combination between of you and that other, other person, because all sorts of little structural things can actually make a big difference. Awesome. Well, thanks. Thanks mm -hmm. for, for answering those questions. Maybe, what, maybe uh, before we leave, Uh, mm -hmm. Talk to us about what's next for you. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, it's been a challenging year uh, for mm -hmm. everybody. But uh, what do you what do you expect for uh, 2021 and and, mm -hmm. and beyond? Yeah, you know, I feel really lucky that uh, um, to have been working. You know, to be at that sort of early stage of starting a company where it's a small team working together. I think the transition of a small team to working from home and working remotely, it's just easier to, to, to have that communication and build it up and make that transition when you're, when it's five people having a conversation rather than 50 people needing to figure everything out new. So, so that's been, um, so that's been uh, good. Um, we're, but we're now making that step of, you know, we're 10 people, we're going to, you know, scale up and go to going to a full, you know, a larger production team. And, you know, that's some of the, the, the questions that my, um, you know, uh, co-founder and I are asking is how do you onboard new employees into an environment where they haven't met anybody in person? How, how do we keep having good, con you know, good communication when, you know, the conversations are so much bigger and that's going to be, you know, an interesting challenge, but one that we've had some time to work up to. And I'm uh, very grateful that I've um, done, done one company before and made lots of mistakes that I learned from <laughs> so I can make new mistakes this time. Yeah. Do you think it's going to be a trend where this is where we're going? Like I, I read, Uh, you know, uh, yeah. office versus home, or or we'll be back at some point fully in in, in office space. You know, I think that's going to be depend company to company, but I think hybrid and fully remote are going to be much much more common um, than they were before. I think particularly um, in places like uh, you know San Francisco, where I am, where the the you know the housing prices are crazy, um, the 
uh, you know, having the flexibility for people to live farther away and still work with the company is just, you know, that's, that's something that, that uh, was already happening and is just going to happen more. But um, I hope it's in, a, in an environment where we can at least get together, you know, uh, a few weeks a year, have visits out. And I think that that, you know, just a little bit of in-person presence makes it makes a big difference. Fantastic. Well, Emily Gear, thank you for your keynote. Thank you for sharing uh, mm -hmm. all that knowledge uh, mm -hmm. with us. It's mm -hmm. uh, really appreciated. And um, I, we hope to uh, to see you really soon. Okay. So thank thanks you so a much. Lot. All right, everyone. So we have uh, a little break. It's going to be actually uh, exactly six minute break, and uh, we will be back uh, to uh, our panel. The next the next uh, portion of this is the leadership panel, uh, building and managing teams in 2020. So five minute breaks, and we'll see you soon.